I'm going to give. <clears throat> I'm going, to give one, I'm, not, I'm going to give another pass through these scriptures, although we didn't go all that far through it. But this time I just want to take a quick look, and then we'll come back to 1 Corinthians uh, 1, uh, starting with 18. But I'd like for us to look at 1 Corinthians 2, 2 first, just so we can get an idea here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. For I am determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so this is Paul's theme of the book, and if you know anything about Paul, this is actually his theme of every book that he's ever written, every conversation he's probably had in, about the Lord. But the thing that I wanted you to notice about him stating that here is that this is a determination in this letter. And it's easy to get lost in, in some of these epistles, some of these letters, to think that he's left his theme. But he says here, I am determined not to know anything among you but Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, Christ crucified. And when he says I'm determined, that means no matter what subject comes along, no matter what area he gets into, he is determined to preach Christ crucified throughout this. All right. Uh, let's go back to the first chapter. <clears throat> and... Uh, Paul is, in, in verse 13, he's already dealing with these divisions that are going on in verse 12, uh, actually, where he says, uh, verse 12 says, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, or I have Apollos, or I have Cephas, or I have Christ. And then he says, is Christ divided? Was Christ crucified? Uh, well, I mean, was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, you know, the word baptized is... Uh, any baptisms that took place, folks, you do that in a recognition of our death and Christ coming up. I mean, water baptism is an, an acknowledgement, not just an event, not just a ritual. Water baptism is an acknowledgement of our faith that when we go down in that water, that represents our death. And when we come up, that represents Christ as our life. That's what water baptism represents. So when Paul mentions, was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul, he's still talking about the cross. He's talking about Christ crucified. That's his center focus. That's the thing that he will always go to because they're having divisions and he could say, well, you know, morally or ethically, it's not good that we have divisions or there's a scripture in Proverbs that says you know don't you know uh, what is it um, these things God hates you know one that sows discord among bread well while all that is true <clears throat> you know and we, we, we dealt with this and I'll, I'll probably go back over it a little bit uh, when we get to the third chapter but we dealt with this in the last course that we took which was the tabernacle and the last part of it, we went through 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where we showed that Paul saw division as those who are doing that as Babylonians. And those who were always edifying, building up, they were temple builders. And that this, this was how he viewed it. And we saw in the very scriptures that those were the scriptures that he was quoting about. Don't you know you're the temple of God? And so his view, I, my point of saying what I'm saying is his view is very different than the average Christian. I mean, it's very different. He, he really sees us as the fulfillment of the temple. And he sees that all that stuff in the Old Testament was pictures to us upon whom the, this reality has come. And he was always referring to that. So that he says the Babylonians were a type and a shadow uh, of not, not the the way we should be and that it was the it, you know it represents uh those who were tearing down the temple or or um nehemiah or an ezra where they're fighting the enemy and they're having to build with one hand on their sword and the other one as building they are fighting um making a stand to build the temple and again that looks so romantic back then but it was only a type and a shadow of doing everything, you know, to, uh, I'm trying to think of this, some of the scriptures that Paul quotes throughout, you know, uh, 
uh, to, to keep the bond of peace, you know, and stuff like that. Well, he's not just, he's not just saying, you know, get along. Why can't we all just get along? You know, he's not Rodney King. He's, he is um, seeing that we are the fulfillment of it, and by this action, you're proving that you're Babylonian. And by this action, you're proving that you've joined with Ezra or Nehemiah or, or Solomon to build the temple. And, um, and as I said, we've already dealt with that in, in uh, the tabernacle class. But I think I'll give a swipe through that just real quick again in this class when we get to the third chapter. Um, um, but for him, it all comes back to Christ crucified. Either you're the one being crucified or you're the one giving your life. You know, I mean, you're either one with Christ. Is Christ divided? I mean, that's what he's saying. You know, is Christ divided? This, this can't be Christ. It can't be Christ crucified because he died to bring us together. You see? And he's, he's just, he really sees this thing the way God meant it to be seen. And not some religious modern day Christianity that has very little to do with all of that and stuff like that. And that's why, that's why the Bible is so hard for people to understand what it's saying. Because they don't understand that this is the fulfillment of that. See, They just think this is today and God just wants us to get along. <laughs> that's just not the truth. Okay, um, and then verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And you, you and I know he'll get into this wisdom of words more in the second chapter, and, and he did right around uh, that, in fact, the verse before and after, I think, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, where he says, I'm determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. Here he is saying, I might have baptized a few people, but just explaining to them what this represents is not what I'm about. I am called to preach Christ and am crucified and, not, and to do it by Christ crucified. Because And we'll see that in the second chapter, and we did see that a little earlier, last two classes. But that, that he's saying, I cannot preach this and live contrary to it. I cannot do it. So I'm not going to use wisdom of, this, of words and try to convince you through all of that. He says, but I'm going to come to you in weakness, and I'm going to come to you in trembling. I'm going to come to you looking foolish, looking weak. And folks, if you, if you latch on to that, you get that all the way through both this, this book and 2 Corinthians 2. It's amazing. You'll just, you'll, it'll just blow your mind, you know. <clears throat> all right, and so uh, Paul's central focus is the cross. And uh, I said, I wrote, the best description is not the good news of resurrection or salvation from hell, but the reality of the cross. And that's what he's really saying. I mean, you know, we would not say it this way. We'd say, I, I have come, well, the word gospel means good news, right? The word gospel means good news. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the good news, not with wisdom and words, lest the cross. Of, he's not talking about saved from hell. He didn't call the good news saved from hell. He didn't mention hell. He didn't mention uh, being uh, 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 forgiven of your sins he didn't mention he's talking about the cross of Christ affecting him in such a way that he will come in weakness and in fear and in trembling and from that will come the power of God and again you see that in the second chapter all right um, and then of course verse 18 the preaching of the cross and really the the word preaching there is the word of the cross. In the Greek, it's actually the word of the cross. <clears throat> the word of the cross to them is foolishness. What do they find so foolish? The thing that is foolish to men is that God would stoop and use his own death as the means of salvation for those who do not deserve it. Okay. Now, interestingly enough, 
we can somehow embrace that or even comprehend through that as long as Jesus is doing that. Uh, I'm, as long as Jesus is the one doing it. Uh, the, the, and we can hear this over and over as long as our minds say, yeah, and think of Jesus doing this. My hope would be that we could be in situations like this where we would, let's see, what was the word, uh, the thing that's so foolish to men is that you would stoop and use your own death as the means of saving those who don't deserve it. Those who are your enemies. Those who um, uh, literally mock your own weakness that is strictly weak for them because you believe life comes out of death. Mock it and take advantage of it. All right. Um, it is foolish and weakness, it is the foolishness and weakness of God dying on a cross. For God's foolishness, Christ crucified, is wiser than human wisdom. God's foolishness, Christ crucified, is wiser than human wisdom. All right, well, you can't see that all the time, you know? I mean, even, even uh, Hebrews, the writer of the Hebrews, he says, you know, um, you know, Jesus rose from the dead and, and uh, all things are under his feet. And he says, but that's not what we're seeing. We see not yet all things, and that's not what we're seeing, but we see Christ made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. He's saying we see the essence. We're not seeing the result so much as the essence. We see Christ crucified as what we're about. This is, this, and again, I believe the first century church, this was the Christ they knew. I believe this, they didn't know the Christ that we talk about and know. They understood him in terms of weakness and self-giving, and that's the way that they lived their life. And again, I'm going to use 1 Corinthians to really show that uh, in a big way, but that, but that scripture in Hebrews is just a perfect example. We see, he could have well said, we see Christ crucified. He said, we see weakness. We see one made lower than the angels. Well, why would he say that? You don't see that now. He's risen. He's risen. Come on, let's have an Easter service. He's risen. He's risen. You know? And start shouting. But that's not what they saw. They saw something that molded them. They saw the cross as a molding instrument for their lives. They didn't just see it as an event that God went through and then we get all the benefits of it. They, and they saw it as the pattern, the uh, uh, prototype. The prototype, meaning the one from which everything else was made. Like in these car shows, they bring out a prototype. Well, there's usually only one prototype at those car shows. They don't make 50 of them, they make one. And if it looks good and people are interested, then they'll make more, you know? So God put out a prototype, and if it looks good enough to you and if enough people are interested, there'll be more. <laughs> That'll be us, by the way. <laughs> we'll be formed after that prototype. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, for God's wisdom, Christ crucified is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. <clears throat> All right. Now, again, uh, just, to, I mean, I'm just throwing this out, but, you know, the, the, there are no Romans anymore. There is Italians, but there are no more Romans in that sense. You know what I mean? There's no Roman Empire. That empire's gone, been long gone, and all the power of it. Christ crucified is still alive and well in this earth, still being brought forth over and over through lives who have yielded themselves to that cross to death so that they could have the life-giving nature 
of Christ for others. And we saw that, remember, we saw that in, in, uh, in the book of Hebrews when we, okay, there was uh, um, the, the tabernacle, last, and then before that was the book of Hebrews. Well, we saw that in the book of Hebrews in what everybody calls the faith chapter, and it is the faith chapter, but they don't understand faith. It's, there's, it's not talking about ongoing victory. Most of those people, I mean, right from the beginning, they're lying on their deathbed. And they're predicting what will come forth out of that death. And it did. And so then they pass on to the next generation. Then they're on their deathbed. And da da da, da. And then the next one. And uh, on and on and on. <clears throat> and, and so that great cloud of witnesses are those who have witnessed the true essence of the cross, of Christ crucified. <clears throat> All right. And then... Uh, Verse 23 um, through 25 says this, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Gentiles foolishness, but unto them who are called. For ye you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise, not many, you know, but God hath chosen the weak things and God hath chosen the foolish things to confound. I mean, it's using the word calling here, but it's verse 26 where it says that, okay? So it's not, he hadn't jumped subjects. He's staying right on the same subject. And so it says, for we who are called, but we go, we read that and we go, yeah, I got called and I'm saved and I'm not going to hell. And he's going, that's not what I, we preach Christ crucified. He just said that. It's not about what's, ultimately what's happened to us, but what's happened in us. He says, for don't you, but he's talking to these Corinthians, say, don't you see your calling? Don't you see that God only chooses the weak? That, that, that God, why would God choose the weak? Why would he have a, a bent, a leaning toward the weak and the foolish? Why would he do that? Because that represents the wisdom and power of God. <laughs> he's not, he's, you know, you can... You can go through the scriptures and you'll find over and over and over again, if you exalt yourself, he's going to bring you down. You, be, you use power, you use pride, you use uh, uh, um, anything to overcome everyone else so that you can exalt yourself, you're going to be brought down. But he will put his hand and lift you up, exalt you, if you go down, if you humble, if you go into weakness, if you go into, well, then that moves him. Because if that weakness and everything is done by Christ crucified, that's what he exalts. That's what he exalts. Well, what does he exalt? He exalts his son. He exalts his self-giving son. And so he put that same son in each and every one of us and said, conform to the image of that son. Conform. See? Because you're saved. You got saved, but did you get conformed? <laughs> You know, and that's, that's the real issue there. All right, so um, but unto them who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And so as I said, the Roman Empire is gone. But Christ is not gone. Christianity is not gone, and those who live by Christ crucified will never be gone. Never be gone. Now, we read that in like uh, at a funeral. Oh, they'll never be gone then. What? It's it's beyond time and space. We're not even talking about time and space. We're talking about eternal essence that cannot be destroyed. It, it can give itself. Do you understand what I mean? It can give itself, but it cannot be destroyed. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Because the weakness of God is stronger than men. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. Okay, one good thing is we're going to make several passes through this. So we're, this is what, our second one now we're going through? <clears throat> All right, and verse 19 and 20 
For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of this age? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So the cross, the cross is God's wisdom, not the resurrection. The resurrection is the result of God's wisdom. Huh? That's really important. And um, it is God's power. Because if, if light, life comes out of death and light comes out of flipping a switch, then light is not there unless you flip the switch. And if the switch in God's mind is his son hanging on the cross for everyone else and being made a scapegoat and accused of all of it and made to believe in front of all of Israel that this guy is worthy of this. But Jesus knows that for this cause came I to this hour. He's not freaking out. <laughs> Why? Because he knows the wisdom of God. He knows that this is the power of God. You know? He's, does he go through stuff? Yes! You know, I was thinking about that yesterday, I think it was, where it says in Hebrews that uh, he for the joy that was set before him despised the shame, da 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 Well, we all know that 99% of the time we focus on that joy that was set before him. But the Holy Spirit just brought me down to that little phrase, he despised the shame. Well, you know what shame is? When they're heaping all this stuff on you and they're accusing you and they're making you look, you know, they're, they're stripping you naked and they're making you look like you're the one and you're covered with all this shame. Jesus didn't go up. Oh, you know, I'm the son of God. I'm a lamb. I love this stuff. You understand? He didn't, he, that's not part of it. It's not, you know, we go, but I hate that anybody that's been through this in the Lord knows that there's a very yucky part to the whole thing. It's not all glory. It's glory to the Father. But it's not all glory. There, you just, Jesus despised it. Because he's pure. Because he's pure. But he also endured it. You understand? Yes. Why did he endure it? Why would anybody endure that? Well, he endured it for others. He endured it because he knew this was the only way. You know, if it's a dark world and you got to flip that switch, and that switch is a cross, he knew it was the only way to truly turn on the light. And so he, he said, okay, I, I'm... There's this part of you that's going through it to the glory of the Father, and you are, there is a, there is a peace, um, but there's a whole other side of it that is you despise the shame of this thing, but you, you cannot, you know, you know, take this away from it. There's despising the shame. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. There is the motivation, part of it is, to the glory of the Father. The other part of it is, ultimately, it's who he is. He, in other words, he's not being murdered. He's not forced into that. He, and he said, at any moment, I can call 10,000 angels. He's, he is on track. That's the best way I know how to put it. He's on track with the glory of the Father, and he's on track with despising the shame of it. Does, does that make sense? Yes. The way the word that came to me was that... Nisi, would you grab that drink for me? Sorry, go ahead. He's not, he's not being murdered, but he's also not being martyred in, the, in, in his own spirit. Like, Thank you. He's not taking on a spirit of, like, like you said, you know, take this away from me. He's, I don't know if I can communicate it in words, but he's not just going, oh, No. But in the sense of being a martyr in his own spirit. 
Right. You know, he's just on track. Right. And he's not being a martyr. I mean, I've years and years made a distinction between a martyr spirit and the spirit of the land, two different things. And, and a lot of times we do. I mean, it can be everything from, you know, I don't deserve this and these people are just mean. And, you know, and that's totally out of whack with the thing. That's just like, you know, that's, 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 you know, well, Peter talks about this and he says, you know, if you suffer because you did wrong, I don't think those are the words he used, but it was something like, uh, but he's, he says, but if you suffer for it and yet you don't, you know, I forget the exact wording, you know, this is thankworthy. And basically he's talking about the same spirit that you're suffering when you didn't do anything wrong. That means you, if you're in the Lord, if a Christian, that means if someone is in tune with the Lord in his spirit, you know, then this is thankworthy to the, to the Lord, it says. And, you know, so we go through all kind of stuff. I mean, there, you know, one of the things that I've seen more clearly uh, over the last several years is this true meaning of suffering. Uh, I've often said all my Christian life, well, if suffering was just holy in itself, then, then India would be the most holy nation in the world because they're suffering more than anybody else, you know. Suffering, there's no, there's no virtue in suffering. There's only virtue in the sufferings of Christ. And the sufferings of Christ means that you've stepped out of you into him and you're taking uh, these things not on your basis. And I know this because I've done both. I have done both. I have, you know, usually a lot of times when I get into something, it takes me a while to get my bearings. You know what I mean? My compass gets hit. And, you know, it's like, well, this, this ain't right. You know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, I'm right, but I'm wrong with, with the eternal heart of God. But I'm right in the circumstances. But, um Ultimately, it is to embrace uh, this for them and for whoever else. It is to go into this death and to let God release something that will touch other lives and stuff like that. You'll never do that unless you believe in life out of death. And, and frankly, I don't, I don't recommend that anybody do it. And here's why I say that. I don't recommend you do it because... A lot of people that'll try doing it don't really understand the true spirit of it, and all you do is end up, you know, what you'll do is you'll try to do it and then still end up bitter and mad, and then you'll end up wanting to kill me for, you know, well, he preached this and it didn't work, you know. So don't do it. Don't anybody do it. <clears throat> but Jesus did it, and Paul did it. By the grace of God, I'm going to do it. Um, <clears throat> because... I am being convinced more and more by the word and by the spirit that this is exactly it if there's ever going to be a change. And when I look around, folks, I see so much selfishness and I see so much uh, abuse of one another and um, all, all kind of stuff. I mean, it, it grieves me even recently situation came up and it grew me so deep of how um, uh, just how bad we are and given an opportunity the junk that we'll do and you know I, I don't know it always flashes in my mind when I see this stuff of I know it's dumb and maybe nobody even knows what I'm talking about but there was a movie called The Green Mile, and there was a black guy in that movie, and he just groaned so deeply at the abuse and the hurts that were caused to other people. And, and to save others, he took it into himself even, and then he went and was killed for something he didn't do. Um, but at times, I don't feel the movie. I feel the exact same sense of, oh, this world is so dark. But, but you know, my, my thought, my thought is, 
you know, we can take the normal Christian way that we think, and that is, it's the world, it's bad, just get me out of this world. Lord, just take me home. But the world isn't the problem, folks. It's us. It's people. It's Adam. And us going in a rapture or, you know, asking God to just knock us in the head and take us is not going to change anything. The only thing that's going to change anything is if someone goes into Christ's sufferings with him, by him. It's the only way. Okay? If we suffer, there's rain. If we die, there's live. If you lose, you gain. There's all of those things that happen. And, you know, I believe that so much that I'm willing to forego just about anything. But it takes somebody to do that. And as I keep saying, by the grace of God, you know, I want to do it by Christ and I want to be with Him. Anyway, um, um, so the wisdom of God reveals God in His essence. Their wisdom, their wisdom may seem superior because it does, because they get away with stuff, and God won't let you get away with stuff, and that's not fair. Do you understand? It really, I mean, there's a time, you know, this just isn't fair. You know, they're way worse than me, and you clearly never deal with them. They don't feel freaked out or anything at any time. They're just going along their happy way, and you're just on me like your hand is like, you know, the hand of God is on me. And, you know, yes. This just reminds me of that passage in Hebrews. It says God chastises his sons because mm-hmm. he's trying to bring us into that spirit He's not trying, if he's not trying to receive that spirit, this is, it's because they're not his son or bastards. Right. You know? That's right. That's he's right. chastising us, that's just so we'll behave ourselves, right. so that we will enter into this spirit. Well, and that's it. We think that he's, he's chastising us because we're bad, but what if he's chastising us because we're not acting as sons, exactly. which is, when we say sons around here, folks, we're talking about Christ the Son in us, okay? That we have no... We are not the manifested sons of God, as some organizations teach. Christ is the son that manifests in, in us as members, and, and he's the son that ultimately we want to be conformed to. So what Mallory is saying is that that, that is constantly, he's working on us, because we are sons, we want to be sons, we want to be sons by Christ, we want to manifest what he wants, but he has to deal with us. And guess what? We're pretty far off, so he has to deal with us a lot, like constantly. Okay? Yes? Yeah, I was going to say, too, um, related to verse 21, that, you know, the, the, the wisdom of the world is foolishness. Mm-hmm. And really, the wis- like, I, I learned this in a life lesson, that, that, the, that the foolishness was the way that I thought, you know, my concept of God. Right. That, that was actually me. That was the foolishness. That's and then I had to learn God. that. I had to learn that by experiencing it and that's right that's right and i think you know i think there's a i think there's a place where we spend years learning this kind of stuff but i think there comes a time when god says okay i'm tired of teaching you i want you to start living it and when he starts putting us into situations like what jesus was put into because that's the only way you can experience his sufferings okay is that you have to be wrongly accused or you have to be, you know. And when he puts us into that, I'm telling you, you see, the, you see all this teaching completely different. I mean, it just, it's like a whole nother teaching because it's like, you know, I mean, I don't know. There's no, it, there's no teeth in it when we're learning the teaching, <laughs> you know. But when you start being put into it, then you go, you know, and somebody's slapping you and accusing you, and you know what I mean? Shoving a spear in your side and everybody else going, yeah, get him! You know, you're kind of going, oh, this ain't right. And all that stuff of the other wisdom starts coming up. You know, you start, you start wanting to get revenge on them. I know what I'm talking about, okay? I grew up in Oak Cliff. <laughs> I know about getting revenge. <laughs> and, uh, are seeking to be justified, but it's uh, there's this big mix of junk, and it all starts coming up, and you go, you know, we always do this. Well, I thought I was past all that. No, you got a bunch of teaching on all of that, and you thought you were past it because you had a bunch of knowledge. But 
when you're put in that situation, all this junk comes up. And again, don't freak out at the initial stuff. Just say, Lord, get me past this by Christ. And he'll begin to reveal his son in you through that stuff. But it's tough. I mean, I'm not, I am not here to tell, you know, and so people say, well, that's all you talk about is suffering. I hate that church. Well, you know, at least my sufferings are sufferings of Christ. You know what I mean? <laughs> at least it's not because I'm an idiot, although I am, but that's not why. I'm... Yes. Just to, um, Louder. Um, <laughs> that there's this, you still have a strength. I mean, you know, it seems like there's still a strength inside of you that can go, you're still able to even consider those things because there's this this thing in you is still able to rise up even in the thought of doing something. It's like you haven't been so taken in your own wisdom and beat down so to the point where you know I hate my own the arm of the flesh, I hate the wisdom of this world, I um, I just can't even I just don't even have the strength to lift myself into that way anymore. just been eradicated by the cross. I'm sure yeah. Well, and that's right. Um, but there, this wisdom right here, this wisdom of the cross does reveal God in his essence. Their wisdom does not reveal God in his essence. Has nothing to do with revealing God. Right. Although some think that it does. You know, I've been you know, I've been accused, well, you preach the lamb, but Jesus was the lion of the tribe of Judah, too. I mean, he's a lion, you know. And, um, you know, uh, they don't mention that, you know, even though the scripture doesn't say it and everybody thinks it does, they don't mention that the lion shall lie down with the lamb. You know, it's actually the wolf will lie down with the lamb, the lion with da-da-da-da. But nonetheless, they don't know the scriptures enough to know that. But they don't mention that the Ultimately, they're becoming all becoming lambs. They don't mention that. They go, you know, you, you know, I'm following the, you know, I mean, like the the guy, the voice in uh, heaven, you know, to John when everybody was weeping, and he says, "Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah." And he looks and he turns and he sees a little lamb slaughtered. Is another translation a slaughtered lamb, a slaughtered, not sheep, lamb on the throne. He says he looked and he wondered. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. Did you have your hand up or somebody? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and um, so this, this wisdom really reveals God. And the other one is completely devoid of God, even though, like we said, with the, the lion or the king or whatever, the, you know, we're all, you know, for the, the other example I always think of is people say, well, we're king's kids. And you hear that all the time. We're not king's kids. The king is Jesus. And we're not his kids. He's our brother. You know, the fa we're the father's kids. We're not king's kids. You know, and it doesn't say we're king's kids. Well, where did that come from? Well, somebody said it and everybody went, oh, <laughs> it's just so cool. It's, it's totally unscriptural and there's no sense to it if Jesus is, you know, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, we're king's kids, you know. I mean, don't, is there no guideline? And the guideline is Christ crucified, the wisdom of God. Anyway, all right, I get a little excited. Apparently, I believe in this stuff, but oh, gone. All right, and then again, their wisdom may seem superior in, well, you know, don't let people run over you and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know, there's a difference between letting people run over you and being one with Christ crucified. Completely different thing. So that's another reason why I tell people, don't do this. Don't do it, because they're thinking I'm saying something I'm not saying. And I know they are, and I get it all the time, and I hear reactions back that clearly they're applying this to something else, and I would never want them to do that. That's what they got out of it. So, and then so when it comes right down to it, well, that's what you taught. No, that isn't what I taught. I taught Christ and him crucified, not you trying to be Christ. Amen. All right, sorry. But um, 
Christ crucified is a stumbling block to some, but Christ crucified is the cornerstone upon which the temple is built. Right? What is, what is the verse here? Um, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Okay? We preach Christ crucified. That's the stumbling block. Okay? But then, let's look at a few other scriptures. Keep your place here in Corinthians. But this is a good little momentary search to just um, compare some of these scriptures that we hear all the time in light of what Paul's talking about here. Let's go to 1 Peter, I think it is. Well, you know what? I just remembered that talks about this over in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians 2. Let me just double check something. I thought it did. Oh, he, he says, for no other foundation can, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ and him crucified, okay? And he's talking about being a, a wise master builder. All right, now let's go to Peter. First Peter 2. I don't know why I'm having a hard time here. Two, uh, f four. <clears throat> to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house. Okay, we don't want to get into the priesthood part. We did when I taught the priesthood class. We only want to see this in light of a stumbling block to some. To whom coming as unto a living stone. In other words, they're coming to Jesus, not as a Christian. They're coming to him as part of the temple of God. And they're seeing themselves as a stone fit in fitly joined with him and therefore one with him so that, so that they're not just a living stone because you have to see this thing to whom coming as a living stone disallowed. This is talking about Jesus to whom coming a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious ye also as living stones being built together built up. Do you know what that word is in other places? Edified. Built up. It's the same word. And they chose to translate it, uh, you know, unless Mallory's got a different translation there, um, a spiritual house. All right. To become a spiritual house, Jesus is both the chief cornerstone, the foundation, and the one who inhabits the house. Okay? You have to see that. Because ultimately, to become the temple of God, God has to live in the temple. Or you're just a temple. Or, or a vacant apartment. <laughs> a lot of Christians are not living stones, they're vacant apartments. <clears throat> All right, there's another scripture. Oh, verse uh, 5. Let's say, no, I did that one. Verse 8. Still talking about this same thing. Well, let's go to 7. Unto you, therefore, who believe, he is precious, unto, uh, but unto them who are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them who stumble at the word, being disobedient one to, whereunto they were appointed. All right, so here he is a, a stumbling stone, a stumbling block, just like what it said over there. What is a stumbling block? Becoming a temple? No. Christ crucified is the stumbling block that keeps some from becoming the temple. And so, if, if you will, I'm just going to try to, uh, this off the top of my head, there's a stone there. It has no designation until somebody comes up to it. That stone is Christ crucified. Okay, when they come up to it, 
They either say, that's foolishness, him dying, God coming down and dying and thinking we're supposed to do anything like that. That's all just foolish. God wants us to be prosper. God wants us to be rich. He wants everything to be, you know, and that's foolish. Folks, then that stone to them has just become a stumbling stone. Christ crucified, because that's what it said, didn't it, in Corinthians, that it's Christ crucified that is the stumbling stone then it's become a stumbling stone to them. Someone else comes up and they see it and they say, oh my God, this is the wisdom and power of God. I know, I see how foolish it is to our minds, but I receive what God says concerning Christ crucified and that's the wisdom and power of God. They just are transformed into a living stone built into this thing to become a habitation of that God, that Christ. Christ crucified, that nature, that essence within the whole temple, okay? So it's all, the stone is, you know, it's really, it's just a stone in a sense. I mean, if you think about it, it's only a stumbling stone to those who don't want Christ crucified. They may want Christ, but not Christ crucified. But he didn't do anything. It's their reaction to him. And the other who comes up, it's the same thing. He didn't do anything to them. It's their reaction to him where they become built into this thing because they embrace the wisdom of God. They embrace the Christ crucified as that wisdom and as that power. Did you have your hand up? Well, a long time ago, just go briefly to that. Some would just trip over it and be broken for a moment. Yes. But others would allow it to literally crush them in the sense of bringing them into that death and bringing them forth in that same spirit through the cross really being embraced. And these guys just tripped over it, but others allowed it to bring them into that same image through the cross. Amen. Okay, let's go to Psalm 118. This will be my last one on this little thing that we're talking about here. Psalm 118, verse 20. Let's see. Well, let's start at verse 19. That way we can stay in keeping with what I shared during the conference. All right. Psalm 118, verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. The gates. Okay? <clears throat> the sheep gate. And I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the head of the corner. How many of you believe that 19, 20, and 21 is talking about Christ crucified? Well, good, because that's what it was quoted by Paul from these scriptures to show that. And so, the, so it proves that the gate that's being opened to him is the sheep gate, and it is entering in one with him, Following the shepherd, who the, I mean, listen to Jesus. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He that follows me knows my voice, da 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 da, and he will follow me and go in and out. And Anybody see this in the light of Christ crucified instead of in the light of, oh, he's the good shepherd and he's going to lead me in and out of this little pen? You know, how deep is that? He's going to take me into a pen and then out of it. That's really precious. I mean, come on, think that through a little bit. It's really precious. He's going to take you into a pen and out of it. Is it really that exciting? <laughs> What's exciting is to know that's the sheep gate and that's the pen, the holding pen. He's going to lead you in and hold you there for a while and then he's going to take you out and you're going to be lay down the same life that the good shepherd lays down because that's his spirit and that's where he's leading you anyway and that's any shepherd in Israel that's where he led the sheep therefore all of a sudden he quits talking about that gate and being led and he goes the stone which the builders refuse has become the head of the corner this is the Lord's doing it is marvelous in our eyes this is the day which the Lord hath made we will rejoice and be glad in it Instead of walking out, and not a cloud in the sky, and it's warm, you go, oh, now this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's just rejoice. Everybody's going, oh, praise God. 
Let's just have service outside. Right in the big midst of the day the Lord hath made. That's a total perversion of verse 24. This is the day, this is, we're gonna all go die. To the cross we go. Will you jo rejoice with me? No! And they leave the church and you end up with the Yes. What we're seeing today about the following shepherd and how no shepherd would ever save the sheep from the altar. No. And a, the good shepherd will not deliver us from the altar. Absolutely not. You know, but, but what is humankind's idea of the Lord being our shepherd? Of a good, or, or a good person, shepherd. Or a person being the shepherd. Right. You know, would be the, they would save them out of all that stuff. Yeah. But a good shepherd would never do that. Well, and I saw that years and years ago. I saw that what being a pastor was, a shepherd, the same word in the Greek, pastor, shepherd, is the same word. And, and I saw that if I was really going to be the kind of shepherd that God wants, I was going to lead them to the cross. I was going to lead them into the sheep gate and then to the altar, and they would be sacrificed just like every sheep in Israel basically was planned for, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when I saw that, I started preaching the cross even harder. But, you know, and the, the harder I preach it, the more people say, well, you're not a very good shepherd. You're not a good pastor. This, you're a terrible pastor. You know, the pastor over here, he loves us, and he, 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 he just, you know, ruffles our ears like that behind our ears and scratches and goes, oh, you're this cute little, you know, I mean, I, I've always known there was something wrong. Years and years and years ago, somebody gave me a picture of Jesus, you know, and Jesus, and he's holding this sheep, and this sheep's face is literally right here, like the way you'd hold your wife or something. And you should see the stinking eyes on this sheep. It's like, like someone in love, you know. <laughs> oh, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you're going to die, baby. <laughs> 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 you know? But, you know, I mean, because he's a good shepherd. Because he's a good shepherd, that's why. But... Again, the wisdom of this world is completely the opposite, so how are they going to get that? So they're not going to get it, so guess what? They're going to think you're foolish and stupid and, you know, leading people astray. And remember what we, we covered during the conference. To actually lead astray is to lead the sheep, not go through it, and not go to that altar. Yes? I, just, I have this picture in my mind. I've seen images of, you know, the good shepherd is... is saving the, the sheep from hanging off a cliff or from being stuck in a bramble or, you know, the good shepherd helps the sheep along getting out of these bad situations. Right. But the reason is because he has somewhere else he wants to, you know, it's the, sure. the bramble of the flesh or the cliff of the enemy, but it's it's because we're going somewhere else. We don't right. want to get stuck in this, you know, I mean, if there is a saving out of situations, it's saving us from ourselves. So we're getting distracted from right. where we're headed. Which is to the altar. Yeah. 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 You know, well, then you consider a wolf in sheep's clothing, which is Jesus' words. And a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, just go, okay, come on, sheepy. We're going to go to the, through the sheep gate to the altar today. And that wolf is not going to want to go. Right? Because he's not a sheep. He's, it's not his nature. He, his nature is to kill. His nature is to make everyone else die. His nature is not to die. The sheep's nature is to die, especially in Israel, to die for what the whole nation is about in relationship to God. And, and as I said, the whole idea of worship to them was sacrifice. This is how you worshiped God, was that you offered up the lamb, you know. And um, so, you know, I think wolves in sheep's clothing are way more prevalent than what we realize. And yet, um, well, even then, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Folks, the only sacrifice that is acceptable is the one that's without spot and blemish. So we're either one with Jesus, made without spot or blemish. I mean, think about it, because we go, he said that you're without spot or blemish. Well, we go, oh, we're a bride without spot or blemish. We're, we're. Well, that means that you can go to the cross now. He's cleaned you up, and you can be offered and be an acceptable sacrifice. 
We don't get any of this stuff. It's just like, well, it's, it's tough. You know, I've heard people say, well, none of this makes sense. Well, it makes perfect sense with the mind of Christ. But it does not make any sense. And you can't make it make sense. And this is why Paul said, I don't preach the gospel with wisdom of words. I'm not trying to make sense here. You know what I mean? I mean, there was a time in my walk that I tried to make the to make it make sense by using the wisdom of word and what I did was all I did was water it down honestly and I'm not I you know people go well you're just trying to be mean or you just won't get off this subject or whatever ultimately we keep seeing this without spot or blemish uh, the, the good shepherd I mean if we keep going on all subjects they all end up there you can't get away from Christ crucified because that's the essence of God how would you ever leave that, you know? So Paul says, I'm determined not to know anything. Well, what about that? What about righteousness? Righteousness is right standing. And if you want to be in right standing with God, it has to be Christ. Well, you know, what about, you know, families, you know? Uh, shouldn't you preach more on families? Yeah, we're the family of God and Christ is our union. And, and uh, husbands, love your wife as Christ. Wives, submit your husband as unto the Lord. Every ounce of it has to come out of him. And, you know, and of course the wife goes, you know, well, you shouldn't be telling me I need to submit to that man or whatever. I ain't telling you to submit to that man. You'll never do it. You're totally opposite of that. There's no need me telling you to do it. I'm telling you, you need to go to the cross and die. Well, that's worse. You know, I'm leaving this church. Well, I don't blame you. I mean, I don't. I don't blame you at all. With that kind of wisdom, of course, that's the way you think. And, and so, you know, um, I don't get near as upset with people as they get with me because I can totally know, I understand where they're coming from. So I don't get upset with that. Well, of course you're that way, you know? It's like a, a little kid, you know? Little bitty kid, and you say, go in and wash the dinner. I'm talking to Grace, you know? Uh, she's, you know, she's staying with us this this while the Ben and Cass are gone to Arizona and you know uh, Grace go in there and wash the dishes for us tonight I mean you know Deb cooked the food and everything you need to go in there and wash the dishes well you know she don't know what's going on well you stupid little what do you you know you rebellious little, you know do you understand what I'm saying what is the use of any of that none of that's gonna work she can't, she can't do it. She can't know it. And that's another reason why I say the stuff that I say. This doesn't apply to you. It may apply one day, but it probably doesn't apply to you right now. And if the Lord's showing it to you, then it applies to you, but not because I'm teaching it. I just don't know how to put it to you, but it's not my responsibility to bring you into this. Jesus is building his church, but guess what? He's building it on him Christ crucified is the foundation because remember it says this is the stone which the builders and Paul says right here Christ crucified is a stumbling block that's all it is you know that's you know, it's, like, it's, it's really not that big of a mystery to me neither the Lord nor them so let it rip it's going to go the way it's supposed to go you know what I mean all right, um, verse, uh, let's see, let me just, we read verse 23 and 24. Let me read a comment here. In verses 23 and 24, uh, declare that Christ crucified is the power and wisdom of God. Notice again that it was not the power of resurrection that is the power and wisdom of God. Jesus proclaims that God's glory is found not in the resurrection, but in the death. Here, power is linked to the crucified Christ. It does, it does just say Christ in that verse. It says Christ, but the next verse shows that it is a reference to Christ crucified. So it is Jesus who is the power of God, but only in his crucified form. And that's, that's important. Christ crucified is the wisdom or the power of God. Jesus is the power of God, but only in his crucified form. Jesus is the wisdom of God, but only in his crucified form. Why? Because that is the purest essence of who he is. Okay? All right. 
Um, therefore, the weakness demonstrated in crucifixion is the power of God. <laughs> it is foolishness, isn't it? <laughs> God's choice for demonstrating his power before men was on a cross, appearing weak and defeated. And he did that. See, no one can uh, disagree with that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, where is it? God's choice for demonstrating his power before men was on a cross, appearing weak and defeated. Nobody, they'll say Jesus died on a cross and that's where the power of God was manifested. You know, they'll talk about that kind of stuff. They don't see it as his nature. They don't see it as, a, as his essence. They don't see it as what he chooses. If he has to look into the earth and choose something, he calls, he chooses that which is weak and that was, you know, uh, powerless and, you know, foolish. Um, all right, so God's choice for demonstrating his power before men was on a cross, appearing weak and defeated. And God's choice... God's choice. I mean, I have been meditating on this for a couple of years now. I've written tons of stuff, and I'm, I'm going back over what the Lord's given me and over and over, because even though I think I understand that, I don't understand it. N not to the way that I need to understand it. God's choice for demonstrating his power before men was on a cross appearing weak and defeated. Just, I'm telling you, even when we think we know what that is, there's a wall that must be broken through because it's got to be more than just a, a finally an embrace of the fact of it. I mean, something's just got to crash through, and all of a sudden it's just like, oh my God, you know, it just changed. It, well, it defeats that wisdom of this world. Where is the wise? Well, you're not him anymore, you're the foolish. And he says that over in chapter 3. All right. <clears throat> Paul found that this principle became his greatest means of power and strength. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 uh, at through 10, when I am weak, then am I strong. You agree with that, Chris? <laughs> well, if you didn't hear it, he said he agrees with that. We were talking about that during the break. We must see that at the cross, God chose to not simply save us by this method, but to introduce us to a new kind of power for living called weakness and powerlessness and foolishness. <laughs> I'm going to read that one again. We must see that at the cross, God chose to not simply save us, but by this method to introduce us to a new kind of of power for living called weakness and powerlessness and foolishness. However, we who belong to him are, are to call it power and wisdom. Because this is the power and wisdom of God. The cross is the power and the wisdom of God. Christ crucified. So we don't, they call it weakness and power. God calls it if you want to call it the weakness of God, it's greater than men, greater than all the power of men. All right. However, this is contrary to the world where men seek status and influence, and they see dishonor and suffering as the lot of the weak masses and the enslaved nations. Now, this is a fact. This is why Jesus was so foolish to the Romans and to the Greeks and everything, because they, um, they, they seek status and they see dishonor and suffering as the lot of the weak masses and the enslaved nations. This was built right into the Roman culture for folks. There was a caste system and everybody was always working their way up trying to get higher in this caste system. And it may mean kill somebody in the, in the way. All right. But Paul writes of this great power of God while sitting in a prison cell bound by Rome. <laughs> You gotta love that, don't you? I mean, he's writing about all this stuff, and you know, he's like in prison and everything. These Romans have him in prison. They're threatening to cut his head off. They're threatening to do all this stuff, and he's sitting in there writing of the glory of these things. And 
this book is part of that reverberation of him embracing it. That's where it's still the reverberations of the reality that life comes out of death and he ain't dead. Neither is Abel. His blood yet speaketh. You know? Because they both went into death by Christ crucified. And that's why it was his sacrifice. We always go, what do you mean that the sheep that he offered? No.